Hello, everyone. Whoa, this is loud. Um, nobody can accuse me of speaking softly. Um, welcome to tonight's lecture by Sho Shigematsu. Part of this semester's Berlaga Keynotes, our ongoing series featuring internationally prominent architects, designers, and thinkers who are at the forefront of design discourse and innovation. We're pleased to have this lecture included as part of the program of the Conference for Artistic and Architectural Research taking place within our faculty this week. Sho is a partner at OMA, based out of the New York City office. He has been a driving force behind many of OMA's projects, leading the firm's diverse portfolio in the Americas for the past decade. Together with Jason Long, he has recently co-authored the monograph, OMA New York Search Term, the first compendium of OMA since content and SML Excel. Alongside the presentation of more than 20 architectural projects from a new generation of the firm, this gorgeously produced volume also includes dialogues with leading policymakers, museum directors, artists, fashion designers, musicians, chefs, and curators. From Virgil Abel and Iris Van Hepren to David Byrne, and Alice Waters, who provide insight into OMA's interests and preoccupation beyond uh, the realm of architecture. Welcome, well, back to the Berlaga. Uh, you were once a participant yeah. many years ago, yeah. so great to have you back uh, at our institution and now within the uh, confines of this wonderful building here at TU Delft. So the uh, orange floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, you. Show. Hello, good evening. Um, this is really exposed, so it's very weird. Um, and I gotta step back um, because it's very overwhelming, like a wall of people. Um, well, it's, very, it's a great honor to be here and also be able to speak where once I studied, but also in a very respected university such as Delft. Um, I lived in Holland before I moved from Japan, and then 10 years after I moved to US uh, 15 years ago. So now I'm outside of Japan 25 years. Um, then maybe I can start a little bit of the introduction of my you know, background as a Japanese architect. Um, as you know, Godzilla is not just a kind of fantasy, but it really represents how Japan is being destructed by natural disasters over and over again, but also, of course, through the war um, in the in 40, 40s, as you know. And this Godzilla is really a symbol of how Japanese cities actually, uh, you know, get destructed but constructed uh, after. And I was really interested in this, of course, issue. Not that I was actually born right after the war, but my parents did. Uh, but Japan had also has, uh, went through other disasters, uh, which is like uh, economical disasters, basically. Uh, and this is, as you can see, um, like a Japanese economy in kind of steady decline uh, since, the, since the war. Uh, it had 9.9% .9 growth on GDP, but now, as you know, it's like zero or minus. It's marked by like three, dip, three big, you know, economical crises, as you can see, like oil crisis uh, and like credit crisis. And this is the superimposition of my life. Uh, you can see in pink, uh, basically I was born right after the oil crisis and then attends university right after the economic bubble bursted. And I became a partner of OMA right at the credit crisis. So I'm really doomed to live with like crisis, uh, natural crisis, but also economical crisis. So I was actually interested in what crisis means in architecture and urbanism. So I did the studio at Harvard about actually investigating post-crisis. Uh, I won't go into the result of it, but this is one of the results that, uh, that if, if, you, if the indicator of economy goes down, basically this is a kind of very simplistic way of 
concluding, but the thinking actually goes up. So I was really interested in how the, the recession does to economy and people's thinking. So for example, one of the typology that rises during the recession is like religious architecture, especially like in US, this kind of arena style churches are in the suburbs that are built next to the malls. And we also investigated when how the inventions are made, uh, and to, to, again, to conclude simplistically again, there, is, uh, there are a lot of inventions that are made during the recessions historically. Also, a lot of architecture books were written during the uh, recession, obviously, because when there is no work for architects, easier to commit to writing, uh, I'm assuming. Um, and coming from Japan, this is the... Um, architecture that was in 60s, as you know, metabolist, that has a sense of gravity, sense of materiality, sense of vision, sense of many things. Uh, this is what's uh, after like uh, 30 years of recession, what happens in Japan that people think this is a kind of minimalistic uh, architectural expression of Jap Japanese uh, style, but I personally think this is almost like a representation of a long time recession where, you know, a lot of ambitions, a lot of visions were not really uh, achieved. And for me, this is, I, I really want to correct as a Japanese architect that this is not the Japanese mainstream. It's just like it's covered a lot in media as a white, uh, minimalistic, cute, whatever you want to call, but for me, that's, that really doesn't represent the complexity of Japanese society. So that was an uh, introduction, maybe not me, but like my frustration. Um, and now I want to go into the book that we just uh, published, OMA New York Search Term. This is really representing how OMA is evolving because of course this is the first book that came out of the outpost, not as a whole. So this is just the work that uh, I was involved in. Uh, as you might know, OMA has offices, uh, major offices in Rotterdam, Hong Kong, and New York, and I've been running the New York office for uh, 15 years. Uh, this is just a very uh, interesting evol evolution of OMA. Uh, as you know, OMA started as a collective with Rem and Elias Angelis and other people from AA. And for the longest time, REM was incubating all these young offices, as you can see in the center. So it really acted as an engine for, of course, architecture field, but also generating a lot of promising young architects and the firms. Uh, there are more by now. But what ha started to happen is that uh, now that I belong to, let's say, this generation, like with Bjarke and other people, um, that we started to compete with these people in every single competition. And we started to realize that we are basically incubating our competitors, which is good for Rams legacy, but not, not really for my. We have to compete with our friends. Um, but maybe that's nothing to do with where we are now, but we have uh, nine partners now, or eight now, sorry including REM, and we decided not to pretend like we are best buddies and we can actually make a collaboration, uh, but we are cultivating uh, projects per uh, partner. So there's an umbrella of OMA, but each partner is getting their own projects and uh, executing it and also communicating that to the world. So it's more becoming more like a collective which maybe was the point of the OMA in the beginning. But this is still an experiment. It hasn't really uh, happened for a while. Maybe it's like past five years, this direction has accelerated, but let's see how, how it goes. But we like it because it just is a little bit different from just promoting OMA now, but really individual. So it's, it has kind of both aspects. Uh, so OMA New York uh, has, of course, started as an outpost of OMA. It was always considered as Dutch office, but now uh, through a lot of iterations, um, REM also was not so interested in U.S. when like Bush regime was there. 
Uh, and, you know, with the sheer distance, I had to really build up the New York's identity as a young office. So it started from five people, and now we have about 61. Um, it, it died, but now back. Uh, so these are the diversity of projects that uh, we had designed, and now many of them are being built, which I will show you after the book. But then, at the same time, we had to, we started to think that we are actually getting to something which we didn't really know what kind of identity that is. Of course, there is an image of OMA. A lot of people think we're still like uh, under OMA's style, which is true, but we were also interested in, uh, this, let's say, individuality or our identity as OMA New York. So that was a starting point of uh, looking at ourselves and under, trying to understand ourselves by creating a book. Uh, this is just an example of how eclectic we were. Like this is Cornell University's architecture faculty project that we did, but throughout the long process, we made, we make, we still make books. But you can see like different style of books, different graphics, different. Uh, whatever, and it's, it, it was so eclectic, and we, well, partially because we embrace a lot of uh, experimentation, but also individual uh, taste uh, on certain things. Uh, we, also, we also embrace uh, this kind of simple communication tools using hands, for example, uh, but still also, again, uh, very eclectic or very diverse in its uh, expression of how we even study the form or program, uh, relentless study. Um, but this image is also nowadays, you know, that it's changed through COVID and also with a new generation that is in a way not so up for like and relentless experimentation. So. We are shifting the gears to a bit more efficient production, but still, um, as an image of OMA, you might think that we are very diagrammatic and very not so formal, but in New York, we're really trying to push both agendas. How that ended up, we have all this kind of pile of study models, and we think it's like uh, we are almost obsessive compulsive people that are like keeping everything and doing many things and not so united. So that's, that was also the reason why we thought creating an archive of our work and really trying to understand ourselves was um, uh, meaningful to us. So typically the architects are the investigator of the society, but this time we wanted to be the investigator of ourselves. It's so it really started almost like a project for ourselves. So obsess uh, observations on obsessions. So our, what was our obsessions or hidden obsessions that we generated or obsessive <laughs> observations. So we were more and more we get into it, we, we got obsessed with uh, ourselves. So we had to be obsessed because before that we were somewhere in between like OMA and, you know, like outpost. But here we, we were very interested in really trying to understand ourselves. Um, one, one of the start that we thought was uh, essential was our narrative-based, narrative um, let's say, uh, take on any project. So we do a lot of lectures and, you know, PowerPoint is almost kind of my life, looking at PowerPoints and creating presentations and narratives. So we thought that the book should be uh, a narrative-based, really looking at our presentations of each project, and also thought that we could actually have booklets. We have a lot of booklets, but here we made it almost like an archival book of each project, together with uh, a studio, Lin, who designed our book. So we started to create this kind of catalog of each project with very simple information like this, really kind of archiving at the same time. At this point, the project of our monograph was not even there. It was really trying to create this kind of archive system. Um, so that the content was more of a narrative base, so some key images with text that we used uh, when we are presenting the project. 
But uh, one moment, uh, Studio Lin put together this thumbnail of all the images that was in the book at the back of the bo each book, in which I thought that it was actually more interesting than any of the typical pages, because you, in one glance, you kind of understand uh, what's happening in this uh, project and also have diversity that is uh, not really in a typical kind of monograph, but also has you know, this kind of non-hierarchical, uh, let's say, uh, grid of images that looks like a search engine result. So we actually started to think that maybe this is a more interesting direction to explore. Uh, so then the idea came to actually make a book only with thumbnails. Um, so we actually referenced a lot of other ways of showing uh, while well, communicating the content. So th like, like the um, encyclopedia, where the, like a lot of information are, of course, categorized and aggregated, or like stamp collection, each in, in its category called stamp, but each individual stamps are, of course, unique, so every image is different. Or like uh, this kind of uh, ads in your newspaper where you uh, have value and uh, frivolity at the same time, uh, or catalog, the density of catalog, or narrative-based narrative, narrative -based display of like manga culture where, you know, the slight difference in the grid or the size. Can I change this maybe? I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh. So narrative-based display like manga that uh, each the grid sizes, etc., actually contributes to where you actually guide your uh, eyes. Um, and also, we did like we were interested in this kind of day, our daily life of search engine. Of course, SML Excel was. Um, of course, we had to think of SML Excel. Of course, I'm not going to hide that. Um, which is a dictionary style, which I thought it's a little bit of an old, old school way of uh, communicating your content. So we thought search engine was actually a brand new way of searching, which actually has a non-hierarchical and also sometimes surprising result when you search like OMA New York. Obviously, you get most of the kind of highlights, but sometimes really strange one comes up, uh, not in here, but you know, searching sometimes has some surprises too, which we also wanted to convey in this book. So this like search engine meets PowerPoint was our starting point of how we're gonna construct the book and its aesthetics. So this is the entire page within a single screen. So you can see some, of course, uh, full spread images, uh, but also mainly uh, this kind of very dense uh, like search result or PowerPoint-like aesthetics. We even actually, well, of course, we, in order to do this, there was enormous amount of work, but uh, like this, but we also actually developed this kind of software. This is animation, but you can see there's a kind of, I do play it again. Uh, basically, you, you have a system, CMS, that uh, when you change the image order and the, you can input the sizes that ge automatically generates your page. This, we use this as a guide to systematically make non-designed look of the um, pages. Um, there are of course some text and our attitudes we call, um, for example, preconception is worse than post-rationalization. These are like 13 uh, maybe you might find some interesting, uh, which I always tell making option is easy, but deciding is difficult to young architects because, of course, they, they come with full of energy making options, but deciding is more difficult. Uh, ug ugliness can be more promising. Not every project needs a cantilever. Um, 
Well, but I like, for example, make unknown from the known, which, you know, we always use programmatic ingredients that are typical and, of course, set. But how we combine those different programs actually creates something unknown. Uh, we also mapped how our, you know, projects uh, and typologies are being diverse, diversified. So, of course, in the beginning when I started OMA New York, uh, it was very little projects, but now we have incredible diversity. But also with that, we started to create this kind of trajectory of different projects as a category, which I will show you after this. So that category is in the beginning, like the um, institution, museum, uh, fashion, uh, public realm, etc. As it was introduced in the beginning, we also interviewed people because we thought just looking at ourselves by ourselves is a little bit of a, a kind of lame investigation. So we picked all these people that are in the top of their own domain, but also has a lot of diverse diverse activity, the people that has diverse activities, like, of course, late Virgil, who was involved in fashion, art, and architecture, for example. So we interviewed these people to also really understand and ask, interrogate them what, what they thought about the book, what they thought about the current situation, what they thought about our work. And comparison of those similar questions to each individual leaders, like. Uh, thinkers is actually interesting to follow. Uh, just some beauty shots of the book. Um, and the book actually has also this kind of spreads with uh, project texts, uh, but then it goes quickly into this kind of uh, uh, thumbnails with text. So thumbnails are organized in such a way that in one glance, you can kind of see and understand what you're talking about. Oh, this is about structure of this building. Uh, but the size and like the text actually represents the hierarchy. We even have uh, Instagram uh, pictures really taking advantage of non-copyright Instagram uh, th uh, um, policy. Uh, I would love you to uh, go through this. But uh, so this is just very intense uh, reading. So you can skip and just get the information of images, or you can sometimes read the captions, or you can just go through the bigger images, which we deliberately made that are key uh, images to tell the story. Um, we also have like clean drawings because after all it's an architecture book so we love looking at our drawings too. Um, then at the, at the end we also have a section called index where we searched our own content again like a search engine. Uh, let's say we gave like a, a specific word, let's say architecture, art, inspiration, da 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 da. Uh, which, of course, gathered the images in a different manner than uh, per project. So let's say architecture reference of entire book, then you collect it about, about like this, so you understand our obsession of architecture like slightly more objectively than just looking at each project. Um, so this is borrowed iconography. Uh, facet, so it goes to like architecture language, like food reference, uh, funnel, model army. So it, it has some kind of playfulness, but also has um, some seriousness at the same time, playtime, program diagram. So you can imagine that this is a kind of, like a, let's say in each word actually reveals somewhat our hidden obsession or obvious obsessions. This is a solitude where we collected the images that uh, only single person is in the picture. So there are some kind of interesting search terms that uh, is going through the book. Like this is interesting, it's called stress, but of course 
stress could mean the structural stress, but also people working under stress. Um, so now I would like to go into the projects. Um, so in the order of uh, each, uh, the, the category of the book. So starting from cultural institution. This is one of the first project I did when I moved to US, the Cornell University Architecture, Art, and Planning faculty. So this is a single plate that attached to existing building, like a big kind of one single plate where everyone can uh, study. Um, and this is hovering above the existing road with cantilever. You can see the mess. And there's a concrete dome uh, that intersects to the plate above. And this is a, a multicultural uh, sorry, multifunctional uh, event space in Miami. So it's it, event space as well as like a, a performance art space. It's very close to a beach. I, I really love this image because it really looks like a seashell. Uh, the it's a kind of tube structure so that the, the pattern actually is sustaining the cantilever, another cantilever uh, that uh, is the stress pattern of the, uh, this object. As you can see, this bottom is the cantilever, and this is basically the arches that are sus suspending that cantilever. Within, there's a domed and round space and the black box attached to it. You can use uh, simultaneously like this, or you can divide these two boxes, two volumes into two different event spaces, so you can have simultaneous events. Uh, some post-occupancy pictures from yoga to, this is a roller disco using the round plan, performance, fashion show, wedding. Uh, we just finished one synagogue, uh, let's say gathering space we call, which uh, in LA, um, which I would like to show you. Uh, so there was a, this is one of the biggest synagogue in Los Angeles and it's most powerful one. And they wanted to have more contemporary event space next to it so that they can actually invite people from community or other places to have events and gathering. Um, so this temple, there was a temple, but also there was a historical school. So the site was sandwiched or, or framed by this kind of historical structure. So that only two moves, one is to create a distance to the temple and also to the historical school by swaying uh, in, uh, let's say, setback from those two historical structure, and that generated this shape, uh, and you know, creating some kind of respect because the the after the religious event, people come from here, so this becomes, although it's narrow, become a central plaza for them. And this is the historic school with a courtyard, which we are also swaying away. To, uh, to create more uh, sense of light and air around. Um, that was the kind of beginning of the massing, but then we had to come up with uh, um, three major event spaces. So one is uh, ma the main one on the ground, the second one is chapel, and the third one is a sunken garden, but they strategically connect different assets that are around the site. Uh, so you can see one here, one there. It's hard to see the top, but i show you each of them. Uh, and they have different mat materiality and they intersect each other. The first one is the main event space on the ground that really has the uh, kind of vault that mimics the dome next to it. Uh, this is the main event space, uh, which is in plan, which is quite rectangle and that really contrasts to the actual religious space, but it's directly next to each other. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of vault that has program around looking down to it, so you can see here, it's almost like a tunnel because it's connecting the Wilshire Boulevard, which is one of the biggest artery of um, LA, uh, and connecting to the historical school courtyard. So you can see that's the connection. This is looking back from the courtyard. This is a recent event that they did. It hasn't, it's finished, but it hasn't officially opened yet because of COVID. Uh, but some events already started to happen. This is from the historic courtyard. Uh, there is a foyer um, and a distribution on this side of the uh, slanted part of the uh, building. 
like an Indian well that takes you along the inclined facade with this uh, fenestration, which I will explain to you. And the second space is this chapel space that really frames the stained glass window of the existing chapel, uh, existing temple. So this is half inside, half outside event space. You can see pink is inside and blue is outside. So really taking advantage of the climate of LA that is, you know, doesn't really need air conditioning. So inside, outside is quite seamless. Again, a lot of event capability. This is outside. And at night, they light the stained glass so you can actually really look into the stained glass from this, let's say, tube. The third one is this sunken garden, which relates to the space uh, of the third floor, which has this kind of uh, Annenberg Foundation. It's called, it's, uh, it's a foundation for people for aging. So there are a lot of older people that are here gathering. And sunken garden that relates to the event space. Uh, the roof is also an event space. So it's really like a gathering machine. And those three voids are interconnected, so you have a very surprising moment like this when you look up to the dome from the bottom, and then this is like three of those voids are interconnected to each other, having sight lines. The facade, of course, we tested many, uh, but we ultimately we were inspired by the inside of the dome, existing dome, that it was comprised of all these hexagons. Uh, so we did this system that each it's single panel of hexagon with a uh, window uh, that is rotated to create this kind of slightly more human scale fenestrations. This is very interesting, but uh, it's a single panel. It's prefabricated, so it's same color, same material, same materiality, but uh, depending on the orientation when sun hits, we discovered in the mock-up that the color changes so dramatically. Uh, so we had to re go back to the drawing board and re redistribute the angle of rotation so that uh, it will not create a patch of single color. So it will become more of a camouflage. So this is how it is. It's a kind of similar tone to the existing temple. And you saw how this has an effect inside with uh, full of light coming through it, and playful kind of view to outside. Uh, that really extends everywhere. So this is a bathroom where, the, of course, the mirror is interrupted by this window, or this urinal uh, is enlightened <laughs> by the window, which I probably take that one. Um, now I'm going to go into museums. Um, because we are doing many museum extensions. Uh, as you know, museum has been doomed also to deal with extensions. Of course, Kobu actually predicted that uh, uh, a long time ago. And of course, the museum extensions are the no norm right now. This is my simplistic uh, view of how the museum extensions projects are evolving, in, at least in US. Um, as you know, the art market is always hot and becoming more and more uh, collections and acquisitions. So the amount of collections are increasing day by day in a rapid speed. And in US, community engagement is becoming another peer of activity that every museum has to do. Because, of course, museum used to be very much of a high, high kind of uh, culture thing, but now they really have to give education, community engagement, da, da, da. so they need a space for that. But the gallery space is actually the growth of the gallery space, the speed is so slow. So that means the museum has to, this is my observation, uh, really bridge the gap between the, the slowness of its growth on the physical space, but the, uh, the speed of uh, acquisitions and community engagement. So you will see how we dealt with it. So this is uh, one of the first projects we did uh, in New York office. It's a museum of, National Museum of Quebec in Canada. So existing museum existed here within the park. They acquired a new site next to the church uh, that is facing for the first time in the, the city's boulevard. 
So we, our thinking was that with a single move, like peeling the ground, the park can continue, the city also continues, and art also extends. So every three entities uh, extends at the same time, and art becomes the catalyst between the park and the city. So this is just a simple stack of boxes uh, that creates a new address and new entrance to the museum that is intersecting the church. Uh, so this is a big, uh, let's say, entrance hall, per se, and this is a section of uh, concrete that was a single cast, a biggest single cast in Canada. Uh, and this, um, that hall, but also has this kind of circulation that takes you uh, up to the... Um, these gallery boxes with the monumental stairs like this, and the one that goes out from the box so you can actually experience the park around. <clears throat> Some gallery views. But the point is that uh, we were not asked to make anything, but we thought actually it's in important to create a um, space that, that can make revenues because Canadian museums are not 100% sustained by private donations like US, but also they have to create their own revenue. So we thought that columnless, column-free space uh, like this, flanked by, uh, flanked by these uh, shops, cafe, atrium, coat check, and uh, courtyard can become almost like an event space of its own, the galleries are above. So they actually started using it like that. So for gala, for events, for dance, for music performance, for kids, again, wedding. Um, so this was our response that of course there are galleries above, but to create this space for community engagement. Uh, also the diversif divers diversification of art where a lot of new museums need to be able to do like performance art. Uh, this is another museum in Buffalo in, in New York State, upper New, upstate New York. This is uh, within the park again, um, uh, designed by Olmsted, who designed Central Park. And this is existing museum from 1905 to 1962. This is designed by SON, Gordon Bunshaft as an extension, and our site is here. As you can see, the old one had a very introverted, very kind of opaque facade. You don't see what's happening, but the, their collection is one of the best uh, contemporary art collection in, in the world, but it looks very closed. Um, this is in plan. So what we did, this is the courtyard uh, of Gordon Bunshaft. This is the auditorium. Our extension started off uh, creating a, a kind of gallery on the ground that has four open corners that really embracing that there are parks around and three, there are kind of 360 uh, openness around because this actually created a really strange axial block to the park. So we wanted to represent, recreate another kind of pavilion that really takes advantage of the park around. And then two more galleries on top. But what we did was to find this space between the first floor and the second and third, uh, almost like a continuous, uh, let's say, extra space around the galleries. And here we enclose that because this is very, it, it, here it's a very cold climate. Uh, so the galleries are enclosed with the gla like glass. So basically here we call it promenade or sculpture terrace that you can actually have a view out to the park but also you can start to use the outside of the gallery space. So what Bunshaft, Gordon Bunshaft did was to create, of course, art space with a nature, with a courtyard inside, but we wanted to flip that diagram and create an art in the nature around, again, really embracing more open museum, but also uh, openness to the park. So what happens is that a lot of activities they do, community engagement, gala, uh, you name it, is always visible because the image of the museum is also transforming, in my opinion, in the US where you really have to show its literal transparency rather than this kind of typical museum uh, solidness. So this is those uh, moments. And as you can see, 
the contrast of very closed museum to complete openness with the glazing. So what happens is that you can again use the wall. So you can have a typical exhibition that is visible from the street, but also when you do some kind of projection or mural that also is visible and again like gala or any nighttime activities also visible. So it really becomes a lantern uh, as opposed to a kind of solid box. Um, we also did some intervention at the existing courtyard, which was open, uh, almost creating a through connection to the park so that no, they no, the museum no longer blocks the circulation to the city, to the park, but also worked with uh, Oliver Eliasson uh, on him designing the new art roof. Uh, this was kind of a way to, you know, this is historically kind of charged building where we thought when architects do new intervention, then you get really criticized. But if it's art, uh, they kind of agree. So this is moving forward. This is under construction. Will open uh, end of, well, beginning of next year. Uh, we're also doing another museum extension in New York City called New Museum, which uh, is designed by Sana, as you might know, in Bowery Street. Uh, it's this one. A new museum is also another museum that used to be just ex doing exhibitions, but now they have event program, they have education program, they have incubation program, so you can see how diversified museum activities are. So this is our site next to Sana's building. Uh, and before we started, I was working on Whitney Extension at the early 2000 with REM. We failed, but uh, through that kind of experience, we, I thought that uh, this kind of dichotom typical dichotomy that happens in every extension project, and especially when the building, uh, existing building is new, we thought we have to be very careful about not over-respecting or over whelming or being too subservient or anything. So we actually started to collect images even before we started designing uh, this kind of images that really represents a bit more complex relationship of the two, uh, like Marina Abramovich or rocket launcher and the rocket itself, uh, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, and this is existing site and this is a new site which is skinnier and uh, longer, uh, deeper. Uh, we did, of course, the usual kind of stint. But in the end, the program, given program, was to uh, create an extension that is almost like a clone of the existing building. So it's doubling. But the program constellation was also exactly the same. So what we did is to basically first clone it. That means almost all the programs are aligned. Every level is aligned. Uh, but only difference is to add this, again, this kind of extra space that uh, that they can do uh, community engagement or other program. So this is how uh, we added in, in front of the gallery spaces, uh, this kind of atrium with stairs and dedicated elevators and the circulation that takes you through the building. Um, so this was one of the image that we collected in the beginning, like the verticality and horizontality is kind of balancing itself. Uh, so we were very aware of its kind of vertical identity of Sana building, so we were more restrained a little bit as a horizontal building. And here you can see that we have two setbacks. One is to preserve the windows, and upper setback is of course known in New York, but we also created a lower setback to create a plaza and a buffer space between existing and new, which is here. Because this actually site is at the terminus of Prince Street, which is one of the most active street in Soho. Uh, what happens with this upper setback, as you can see, is that from the street, the upper half almost disappears, basically giving, in, giving the respect to the vertical, verticality of the existing. Uh, so, in the end, this, we were very interested in a museum that somehow is a clone programmatically, but identity-wise, it's rather very different to really embrace the fact that this is not 
just a typical extension, but it's more of a creating a new building that is uh, in synergy, synergy. So this section actually really shows it. When you cut short section, you, everything is aligned. Uh, of course, uh, the, the two buildings look completely different. So the circulation from the street going up, gallery spaces, left is existing, right is new, creating much expansive space. And upper part is more of a production and thinking, like uh, incubator space uh, and small auditorium that has a view to Soho and some terraces. Uh, the facade is this material called Zephar. It's like a Swiss product that has a fine mesh laminated in glass. So as you might know, the Sana building is a huge expanded metal, metal building. So our, our uh, material actually captures the metallicness of this fine mesh during the day. It really appears very solid and sculptural as sing because everything is covered by the same material, uh, but at night it shows its uh, transparency. This is me presenting to Sejima-san, who of course had some comments, uh, which we didn't really revise. Um, um, now, art platform. Uh, this is a project that we did for Sotheby's. The art world is also changing. Now the, the auction houses are not really possible to sustain themselves just with auction. So they are really venturing into like private gallery, private sales, and also having exhibitions in their buildings. So this is the Upper East infamous building huge but not really utilized well so this was existing where workspace and the exhibition spaces were really kind of intertwined and not so clear so we did the master plan a year of master planning really basically consolidating all the galleries below and that was the first phase which we did rather than typical like museum where they want the maximum flexibility by having a huge gallery space here, because of the turnover of different uh, art sales and art auctions, they actually wanted to create a flexibility through diversity, not genericity. Uh, so here we came up with, the, of course, curator and gallerist and sales people that has multiple different dimensions and sizes. And also they were clustered differently in different levels so that one part of the cluster could be closed while the other part could be open. So it's kind of carefully curated and that opened. What happened is that this was an existing building so that the, the careful consideration of the, the different size of gallery didn't really match the, the grid of the existing building, which was a Kodak factory before. So it had huge kind of concrete columns. So that's, of course, in the beginning, we were trying to hide this column by incorporating into the wall, but at the same, at some point, we said that's impossible, so let's actually expose the columns because they are quite beautiful. Of course, columns are typically the enemy of any gallery, but we thought this was actually interesting. So here, for example, if you drop the ceiling, you tend to hide this column cap. So we created this kind of, a, um, let's say, um, vault or dome where you expose the column, and you can see also here. Uh, again, the exhibition spaces are now also event space in US at East. Uh, you see a lot of events could happen. This is even a fashion show of Tom Brown within the gallery, dance performance. Again, a lot of dinners to raise money. Uh, they do car exhibitions too. Of course, it's an auction house, so it has its diversity. I'm working on a very interesting project that is really about the convergence of different minds. Right now in Miami Beach, it's called Reef Line. It's basically regenerating the artificial reef or natural reef again along the entire beach line of Miami Beach. Um, in short, it used to be, of course, like a holiday destination, middle of nowhere, Miami Beach. But in 80s, because of all these hotels that started to rise along the beach, they basically created a new, uh, much deeper beach along the entire length of the peninsula, which actually killed the entire 
the reef system at the time. So basically, they they created a great beach, but they killed all the reefs. So now there's a group of entrepreneurs, and we are the master planner. The red, it's hard to see, but the red is a reef line. We're trying to regenerate the entire reef system along the beach, uh, which does, of course, environmental protection, but also uh, we will deal with the erosion of the beach because if you have reefs, basically the, the wave will become little uh, milder, so the erosion will be slower and also will deal with uh, sea level rise. So it has all this ambition. But um, revitalizing the reef is easy. You just drop like concrete tetrapods and actually there are a lot of different systems to it. But what we thought, or this entrepreneur, Jimena Caminos, thought was to actually put the conc or, uh, sculpt art sculpture into the ocean so that it will simultaneously become a sculpture, underwater sculpture park that the reef will grow over. So this is the first, um, this will happen this winter. Uh, the, uh, uh, Enrich, uh, Leonardo Enrich, this uh, Argentinian artist who is kind of doing a cynical sculpture of so called traffic jam, a lot of car, concrete cars are basically embedded within under the water. So what it does is basically it really boosts the tourism, it creates underwater sea scul uh, sculpture park, but also recreates the, um, the reef. And we are the master planner, but we also made the first sculpture uh, and also the kind of barriers. So I won't go into the detail, but how we designed the sculpture was to really look at the underwater activities that are happening, of course, the extreme ones like this. But also, I was always like fascinated by like sea, sea creatures. Uh, so what we did was to just use a single unit of spiral stair, which, of course, in underwater, stair becomes obsolete because we deal with gravity, typically. But underwater, stair is not a, uh, it's basically not needed. So I was interested in actually putting in a different context in how the stair behaves, but also, of course, it looks like a sea creature. And also, in any reef experience, as you might have dived before, uh, it's always looking at the reef from above or next to it, but never really immersed by it. So we wanted to create this arena that you can actually go in and covered by the reef. This was an NFT we just made for last Art Basel. Now everything is NFT. Okay, we just want, we were interested in how this actually behaves differently from, let's say, gallery space to under the water. Uh, now fashion. I have maybe 15 minutes more. Um, the fashion is also one of our interests because the operation of fashion in its speed is completely different from architecture. Uh, and also the fashion exhibition is becoming one of the mainstream uh, blockbuster exhibition in a lot of museums, which I will show you. It started from early 2000s that I did the exhibition designed for Prada. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Waist Down, which was about featuring hundreds of skirts that Mutual Prada designed, only about the skirt. But the team was all men, just so that you know. So it started off um, creating a kind of forest of skirts and legs that are like a uh, like a, you know, printed mannequin, you know, the 2D mannequins style, but almost 2.5 times of the real size. So you are actually going through the, uh, you know, skirts and legs. And in the back of that is covered by mirror. So you see the silhouette in the pure form. So people are wandering through it. We did the kind of flat packed skirts that are in plan. In plan. Typically skirts are only viewed in its elevation. Uh, we used a ceiling fan to exhibit the skirts that has interesting embroideries or pleats. Uh, we also used the car wiper uh, 
uh, inside the skirt to create a sound that has interesting sound. And of course, it wasn't really, you couldn't see the wire, so everyone was actually so interested in uh, what's happening. And of course, this is one of the rare moments that you are entitled to look under the skirts in public. Um, and after that, uh, I was invited to do an exhibition for the Met Metropolitan Museum in New York. They have a costume institute led by Anna Winter me presenting Anna Winter, she looks very un unhappy, but eventually she liked it. Um, the site was in this wing called uh, Lehman Wing, which was not a gallery space, luckily or unluckily, which has full of natural light, which is not possible for exhibiting any garment. So the only way was for us to create a building inside a building, which we call it a ghost cathedral. So we use a very inexpensive scaffolding like you see in New York, but covered that scaffolding with very fine membrane that has a very complex translucency uh, because when you have a light from front, it becomes very opaque like this, but if you have a light from behind, it becomes very transparent. It's often used in the theater, in the stage. And one of the critique of my fashion exhibition nowadays is that there's too many kind of flat screens showing the kind of fashion shows, which I really hate because that really takes away your concentration to actually really dealing with the garments themselves. So we only media we used was really integrated to the space, like a poche here, but also uh, has projected the detail of the garments that you see. So you can see it's already always integrated to the architecture and also never show this kind of models walking. So this is uh, how it was. So the dome, we projected the detail of the skirt below. So it's like a Sistine Chapel, but it's moving. So here you can see, sometimes it's projected the detail of the garments. So you can see where there is no projection, you see this very rough scaffolding as an armature. And when it's projected, you see this a backdrop so you can see the complexity of the translucency here After that, we recently designed an exhibition for Dior's retrospect that happened in Arts and Decorative, a seven years retrospect of their entire, uh, entire uh, house. Uh, here we had to deal with uh, Daniel Libeskin designed Denver Arts Museum that has, as you can see, there is no straight wall whatsoever. And basically the plan is also never straight. So we kind of came up with this kind of series of cells that are interconnected, uh, that is kind of covered by the very raw aluminum that is bent or curved bent, so that uh, it re reflects uh, the garment's color of in front. So it has this kind of uh, abstraction of the garments in front, and also becomes an armature to hang art, as you can see. We were inspired by this femininity of the, of course, garments, uh, but we thought it's actually interesting to really reflect the colors. Uh, and we are also now doing a building for Tiffany in Fifth Avenue and 57th Street. Uh, as you can see, this site is very charged because, of course, you know the movie. This is the exact building where Audrey was there, but also you can see the neighbor which is a Trump Tower headquarter when actually Trump was in, in power. 
So all the entire kind of, you know, this is where exactly they put this uh, Black Lives Matter sign onto the street in front of the Trump Tower. Anyway, just wanted to say that it's next to the Trump Tower. Um, so the whole renovation is happening. We also adding the top, which is a VIP and event space. Everything is quite standard old building here, but we were inspired by this cornice detail that has very feminine like curve or soft curves. Uh, and also, of course, it's uh, f like covered uh, or the, our neighbors were Trump Tower and the IBM headquarters, which both are so masculine. And you know, we thought we need some kind of feminine take on this brand. Uh, so we use this slump glass. So it's kind of curved by gravity. So you lay it down and you curve it. Almost acts like a curtain that hides the VIP space above. But as you know, if you slump it, um, basically it becomes a structure of its own, so you need less mullion, so it could be transparent all the way, more transparent because you don't need the structure to support the glass. So it's almost there, uh, so you can see here. Uh, it will open end of the year. Um, we're also doing a lot of mixed-use buildings. This is, of course, how REM actually started to talk about in the Lilies, New York, looking at the downtown athletic club, saying that, of course, the high-rise has its potential to stack different program and have create a random encounter of different program. Um, and this one is the land value model of Copenhagen, but, of course, it represents that more center you go, you have to start to hybridize the program and create so-called mixed use. And my kind of, of course, take is that mixed use is becoming generic. Um, so I've been thinking about this a lot and you know, be, I've been showing this slide over and over again to developers and also to architects, but this is city of Tokyo represented by different areas. It's huge city. Uh, the different character and different atmosphere is represented here by different color. When you compare that to like a dinner table, it's for me more like a la carte style. You share and you have different conversations, different types of dishes everywhere. So it's kind of animated as an experience. But nowadays there are a lot of mixed use buildings that has similar ingredients and same type of architecture. So this is representing, for example, Mori building right now, they're our client. Although of course we show this criticism uh, that comprising of basically the same type of ingredients because one succeeds, everyone follows with the same type of program, which I call it a bento box in, instead of a, a, a la carte style. Uh, so kind of prepackaged program. So what used to be very animated as an experience within the city becomes quite uh, predictable in a way because everyone is eating bento box. Um, although, of course, I eat bento box a lot. It's not a criticism to bento box itself. It's about gener regenerating this over and over again and architects participating to create differences because even if you try to distinguish your building through facade or through form or through whatever you want, your inherent experience is the same unless the program changes. So that's what we are always saying that the architects should also contribute to actually interrogate the programmatic values or programmatic, let's say, um, um, let's say, distinguished program uh, so that the experience within the city becomes different. Uh, through that, I just finished a couple of office mixed use buildings. This is in Fukuoka, Japan, where I'm from. Uh, the office building that is uh, cornered by a very different street. One is a uh, huge boulevard and here, here is more cafe street. So we took out uh, the corner, like melting ice cube to make a kind of soft edge, but as well creating a plaza and better connection to the uh, smaller street. That becomes a feature of the building. So it's a pixelized corner that is connected to an atrium from underground system, looking up to the soffit, that becomes like a, has an artwork. 
from the inside. And the upper corner is terraces. It's a huge building because they just changed the zoning also, but there will be more buildings. And this is another one that we're doing in Tokyo called Toranomon Hill Station Tower. So these three buildings were already there. There is a new axis, what the Olympic already happened, but uh, it was meant to be for Olympics. But for the new Bay Area system, they created this new axis. Uh, Mori building, as like Ropong Hills, has been making these kind of different towers, high rises. So we said maybe it's about time for them to think about not individual towers, but towers' uh, relationship to each other. So because there are three buildings already there and there was a new axis, we proposed to actually extend this activity of the street and the green over the street and basically run through the entire base of the building in the center and extend that activity also vertically up in the center. So it really a tower that dedicates to kind of connecting to our different towers that are there and really expressing that axis. Because in Tokyo, it's very rare to have an axis in the city, which I thought maybe it's worth actually expressing through this tower. So you can see the central part has a special program of each program, which consists of shops, hotels, uh, offices, and the museum on top. And that this bridge is actually penetra penetrating through the center of the tower like a public space thoroughfare, like this inside a tower. This is under construction. In order to do that, we typically, of course, the tower has a central core, which is most efficient. We're diverting that to two cores in order for the, that linear park to go through, which was very important for us to give away the most important part of the high rise to the public space so that it could go through the center. It's just a model shot. Uh, not only that, this, has, that's, this is the bridge, but it's connected to an underground, new underground station. As you know, Tokyo has an uh, amazing underground system, and here there's an atrium from uh, getting out of the station, and this is, you're seeing the structure of the bridge above. And above there's a museum that has a great view to the Imperial Palace, and at the top, a very small infinity pool and the park, again, under construction. Let me kind of skip. The, this, these are residential buildings that we've been doing, New York, San Francisco. Uh, this Miami one is kind of interesting because we were, it was a competition. The site was here, it's called Coconut Grove in Miami, which has one of the oldest city structure in Miami. Uh, very lush and very low rise. But of course, through recently, recently, there are a lot of high rises that are built along the water and they have been developed in this sculpture park in front. So this was the last connection of the existing city grid to the city, there's a city hall of Miami here, so to the water uh, front. And this is Biarque's twisting tower, the same client. So the brief was to build a, another two towers because there are a series of two towers. We thought that, was that will block the porosity between the city to the waterfront again. So we proposed to cut that into six slender towers, really embodying the kind of lush nature living of Coconut Grove in high rise too. That creates this kind of porosity and almost like stacked villas, two units max per floor. But we won the competition, but right after we won, almost literally like one after we were told we won, they said, please don't do this uh, six towers because it's too expensive. But you, I like your thinking, but don't do this. Uh, so we immediately, of course, ventured into different system, different sizes, different uh, uh, amount. But here, we, in the end, thought that we, because they liked the initial thinking so much, we should use the ex initial uh, party. So rather than making an entirely new tower, we basically re-merged those six towers into one, like a reverse mitosis. So what used to be like single slender towers became one, like a peanut shape single tower. So you can see the gene 
of single tower here because there are two cores, so there is no cordal whatsoever. So you enter to each unit directly from its elevators, and there is no single uh, cordal. Uh, we externalized the uh, structure so that the inherent flexibility for the future is ensured. Because typically in Miami, everyone wants to put the column inside so that uh, um, the balcony is really exposed. But what it does is that uh, the, there's strong wind and a lot of people actually don't inhabit uh, at the balcony. So this columns actually works as a wind, wind protection, but also privacy screen because, of course, the buildings are kind of close to each other. So you can see the peanut shapes. And the columns are kind of sculpted. And this is the amenity below. From the park in front. More organic. Oh, um, how much time do I have? <laughs> huh? 10 more minutes. 15 more minutes, but there needs to be um, question and answer. This is interesting, so bear with me. Uh, I was I did a studio called Elementary Design at the GSD at Harvard uh, because they asked me to come up with a studio theme that could be carried over many years, so it had to be kind of wide um, and open. So I took a um, um, theme of food because I was interested in this kind of three fundamentals of human being, clothing, food, and shelter. But as you know, clothing and architecture became more globalized. That You go anywhere and you see similar kind of clothing, people wearing same, same clothing, same architecture, more or less. But the food remains quite specific and diverse, in my opinion, because it could come from a very local, specific nature, but it could be globalized, like the terroir culture. Uh, and food is actually officially the biggest industry in the world. Food is multi-processed from you know, um, harvest, farming, harvesting, to post-harvesting, distribution, con consumer and even to the waste. So it really relates to our life quite extensively. So we were interested in looking at architecture and urban design through the lens of food. Uh, in short, uh, for example, this is a broad acre city that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright actually did once a master plan, a new city uh, with uh, the, the notion that everyone has to have agricultural land. But this is his sketch from 50s which is really quite stunning, uh, amazing, because you see like drone flying and uh, electric cars running and high rise and with kind of pastoral environment, which I thought it actually really predicts where we want to go, because I think that uh, in our generation or the future generation always have to think of the, you know, the new vision of the city. And this, I thought, actually captures a little bit of what's where we are going. And this was the Broadacre City's model. Of course, at that time, models technology was not that great. So you see this chunk of green and agricultural land in some towers. But this is what's happening in China now, which I thought actually quite representative of Broadacre City because the expansion of the city uh, is so fast, but still need to sustain the agricultural land to sustain people's food there that uh, this kind of hybridization is happening naturally. Of course, not planned, so I'm not saying this should be the vision, but we thought it was quite interesting, So as you can see. Uh, and of course, the food is coming into the city. Um, so many of the urban farms on top of a roof, and now there are a lot of talks about high-rise dedicated to food production. Uh, there's a city called Super Farm in China that is planned to create food for sustaining the entire population of Singapore. Um, food is also related to mobility. This is the first McDonald's store, which was a car hopping place, so it was connected to mobility. Uh, of course, as you know, the supermarket is also connected to the car, invention of the car with a trunk where you can actually buy the grocery of one week 
so that uh, the, of course, the store had to be big. We used to drive to the food, like the food, you know, um, drive through like this, which I love as an architecture. But now, as you know, it's completely changing. The food is coming to you now with uh, food trucks and also food deliveries because like food related startups are the most amount, of, gathering the most amount of money nowadays. And of course, Rotterdam really embodies how food related architecture could actually be one of the highlight. Uh, kitchen, the great thing about food is that it also involves like smaller scale. The kitchen used to be very much of a subservient room, of course, in uh, uh, BC, but now, of course, kitchen is a social uh, center of a house. So kitchen has to deal with many issues. For example, this is a kitchen that, you, as you might know, that can slide and become a kitchen when you need to. Uh, or this kind of automated kitchen. There are a lot of kitchens that are invented. This is a funny one from Electrolux, the Swedish company called Global Chef. So you can see the hor uh, hologram uh, machine. Of course, it's not, it's not there yet, but their advertisement says that the, you can invite any chef or any of your family member to teach the recipe but in my opinion, this guy doesn't look neither your uh, chef or your uh, family member. So it's kind of high, you know, kind of has a link to Tinder or something. Um, the food itself can be printed nowadays. This is a food printer. Looks kind of disgusting. So we can, this was apparently kind of simulating the art of vase, vase, but it looks disgusting. And then we designed this kind of food port, which is dedicated to growing food, community garden, university research about food, uh, shared aggregation, uh, market, et cetera, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we are doing this kind of post-Sandy master plan to protect the water in Hoboken, New York. And at the end, lastly, we're doing a bridge in Mexico this is a really end, um, which was heavy, hit by the heavy earthquake uh, and in 2017. And we're also trying to do more social work. Uh, and we went there. This is the hardest hit city called Hojutra uh, in Mexico. Uh, and we could pick with the Mexican government wherever we wanted, either to restore a public space or a housing. Um, we were actually interested in this river that runs through Hohutura, and because the, typically the river that runs through the city is an amenity for the city, but here became almost like a sewage. So we wanted to create a kind of a refocus to the water because this is an existing river, which has a kind of, you know, of course, nice typical river nature, but it became very dilapidated, as you can see, it's walled off from the houses, so you don't really engage the water. So we decided to actually make a bridge in this exact location that becomes almost like an extension of the street, uh, and basically creating uh, a bridge from one side to the other, uh, two times, almost like an extension of the bridge. But because it was such a low budget project, we could only use existing concrete mega beam as a basis of the bridge. Uh, so we had to deal with this one. And the budget was accounted for pedestrian line and the bike lane and two small plazas. We thought that uh, we could actually, in 150 meter, uh, sorry, 100 meter, but we thought actually that uh, we could use this lame public plaza uh, money to actually make a double decker bridge using the I-beam nature of the existing, you know, the prototype that we had to use. So basically we elongated the yellow to create a bridge that is simultaneously uh, public space because it's, you know, two stories. So it's almost like a street extension. You have a lower level and you have an upper level. Uh, um, we wanted to create a fenestration, of course, based on the 
um, structural engineers calculations so we did a lot of studies but in the end we had this so sometimes it goes all the way so you can go from one side to the other of the i-beam and in between there's a stair to take you up to the um, upper deck so these are the series of sections you can see it or you, there's a table height sitting height uh, and the stair to go up to the upper deck uh, we wanted to create this kind of straight, straight bridge uh, because it was government project. They thought we thought they could convince this this person's property to make this happen, but they said no. So we had to bend the bridge to avoid it. So this is the final outcome. So you can see the upper deck. The lower deck is for the bikes. Here, the upper deck is for more for kind of resting and chill. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sho. Um, we have a couple of questions, so maybe if there's somebody, we can start by taking the microphone. Thank you very much for your lecture. It was um, inspiring. <laughs> I'm Christy, I'm from Brazil. And I um, got curious to know more about uh, the idea of having this several different um, office around the world. And um, I would like to ask you, how is the relation in between the different office? If there's, how do you work with standards or, or shared values, or if you guys even have meetings and also, what happened when if you don't agree with uh, the design from another office? I know everyone is interested, so I will say very honestly. Um, so working in different offices, because we share the value, of course, we work. I personally, of course, work with every partners, including REM, before I moved to New York. So I know what, who, are, who they are. So, you know. We, of course, are in good terms, but the different offices have different takes. But I think through the method that uh, OMA has been developing, I think it somehow reaches to a level that uh, we think it's kind of convincing almost in every project. But of course, there are better and worse. And sometimes this is a difficult point where of course, there is autonomy and independency of each offices, but more and more, it's harder to engage what, what's happening in other offices, but also to, as you say, criticize uh, or critique even. Uh, and I think we also investigated how this kind of creative companies in general actually starts to be more corporate, which is exactly the moment when they start when they establish a system where you can't critique each other's design. And we find, I personally find it very dangerous because then what we talk about, we, I'm here to meet the other partners every now and then. Uh, so there's still a healthy discussion, but it often tends to be about money or non-design issues, which is more, you know, shareable and you know critiquable because oh you're not making enough money that's easier to say that this design is worse so of course when rem was leading the company rem could you know say whatever he wanted about each project but now there is a difficult balance of critiquing so we are trying to use of course this kind of moment to get some you know feedback publishing book is also one of the moment to expose our you know, projects in the printing matter so that we get, again, responses. We sometimes invite external critique. So we're trying our best to have still a sense of you know, self-criticalness, but as you say, it's, you know, I can only imagine that this goes further, it will become worse. Thank you. I thank you so much for your lecture. Thank you. Um, early in the lecture, actually, you mentioned that you invited different thinkers in order to talk about the different projects. 
So I was wondering which are the insights on how OMA New York is seen through these thinkers, also like thinking about the book as an introspective kind of process. Hmm. Um, yeah, maybe you should buy the book and read. <laughs> <laughs> um, or it's hard to say because um, what the critique they have is often, you know, or comment they have is like collaboration is critical. Uh, this, you know, um, the time, the zeitge to represent the zeitgeist, you really need to uh, look at and observe the world. You know, there are many things that echoes what we are thinking, but of course their individual take on the dealing with architecture or built environment is different, so it's hard to say, but making a book of course, we had an excuse to be very eclectic and very disorganized because it was an archival project. So it was uncurated, right, in a way. Curate the uncurated. And now that it's curated, for us, it's going to be more and more difficult to pretend like we are uncurated. And that exactly what maybe what we wanted, to lose a little bit of the freedom to be very different in different projects, but now we feel that whether we should continue that or we should be a little bit more focused on establishing our own identity. We're at that point that is looking at the book and thinking about it, but it's not, I don't think that's something that we can conclude easily or soon, but uh, what book does, as you know, is to really confront yourself and, well, in my opinion, it's working at the moment, but hard to say what exactly how it's working. Thank you. Thank you so much for an inspiring lecture. Um, actually, my question was a little bit also related to the book. Um, um, well, you were saying that this was uh, an archival process, and, uh, and it was also a way of uh, re-seeing your projects, or like an introspective way of, of, of seeing your your projects through the years, and and I was just wondering because you were also saying that uh, it exposed like your biggest obs obsessions or or your biggest um, observations, and I was wondering what was your take after this whole process? Like, what was your biggest obsession? Um, you know the <laughs> the polemic is that uh, it's looking at ourselves and. Rhetoric is our looking at ourselves, but of course we knew what we are doing. So, of course, a little bit of my lecture talk is about finding ourselves. But looking at ourselves, I find it actually surprisingly boring, our work, you know, because, you know, when I had the first excitement looking at SML Excel, of course we weren't thinking that we could generate that. I mean, but it's still within the kind of realm of like kind of Oma, of course, Oma-ish, and the, there is no like super groundbreaking like project. Um, so I take the, my own criticism is that this really reveals that we are somewhat kind of, you know, mediocre office, but I think that is a good part of us that we can be still young and self-critical and really push ourselves. And But, you know, we are also maybe don't have radical projects like the SML Excel, but uh, we are building more. So I don't know how that balance actually becomes in the history. I don't know 50 years later from now on how we will be seen. Is it better to inspire other architects or is it better to build something for the meaningful, you know, for the, for the good, good of, you know, public and the institutions. So let's see, but uh, it's hard to look at yourself. So it's, I, I'm curious what you think. Have you seen the book? No. Yeah, I have seen some of them. Uh, uh -huh. I knew some of them. Um, I, Actually, I, I like some of them, some of them I don't, <laughs> obviously, yeah. like Omnibus. Uh, but it, I think it, it was quite interesting to see how you expose all the poses in the book. And, and 
yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's quite interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, you know, the process, revealing the process is also becoming a cliche. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, I, I think we are overcoming by dumping all this. So we are on to the next step because we think we just delivered something that is, you know, like represents the, our current moment where always surrounded by PowerPoint and Google search. But now I think we have a next level to reach. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the great lecture. I was interested about the book. Uh, how, uh, how much time did you spend for organizing the archive and how was the collaboration with the Studio Lean? Studio Lean. Um, actually, it was Studio Lane as I presented that small booklet in the beginning, and uh, Alex Lin is very much about, not about graphic design, but, you know, about systematic kind of layout and archiving. So that really inspired us because somehow we were looking for a systematic way of reviewing ourselves, but also we didn't want to make another content book or SML Excel. So we also didn't have manpower and money to actually dedicate our time to design the book. So we thought that was a very interesting system. Uh, and um, the time that it took was maybe from the beginning to publishing, maybe two years, year and a half. Because in the beginning, it was really not about even publishing a book. It was we first generated a mock-up just for ourselves. And then we pitched to the publisher. So it was a kind of interesting sequence of events, but that's how it happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your lecture and your talk. That was so inspiring. Um, I have a personal question. You were having this short input about the, yeah, the diversity in food and how this is actually so inspiring also for yeah, how now the typology in architecture became so generic in a way. So what is your like suggestion? What are you, yeah, what is your personal yeah, opinion on that? Um, you mean the, about the bento box part? Yes, yes, oh, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah, I know it's, I'm criticizing at the same time not really giving any response, which is I thought that was the genius of Rem Kohlhaas who always reveal something, but never really answers how to solve that. But um, for me, what I'm trying to say is that architects are often just hired to create a building that is to respond to the given program. But we should be, as an architect, be critical enough to the given program and create a knowledge that can suggest alternative program or better program or better mix of program, for example. That's number one. Or in Japan, like there are a lot of architects who think going to become an architect is the only way, but you can go to the city or you can go to the developer, and those people who actually comes up with a program also need to be aware of the genericness that is started to happen. So you know, me telling actually developers that bento box, of course, they say, oh, you know, that's, you know, interesting. But, of course, the financial commitment always goes to the safer side. Mm -hmm. But I wish that, uh, you know, that we also, like great school, like Delft also sends young architects to people that will be clients, not just designers. And I think that those are the two things that I'm hoping for by, by just showing that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your amazing lecture. Just a very quick question. Thank you. I was interested in your representation style mm -hmm. because it seems to me through the process that somehow they it's sort of standalone. I mean, every project is, has its own representation. So I was thinking, I mean, I was wondering, do you put any kind of editorial work? Do you have like a representation style you align, you wanted to keep and system somehow? Is that a relevant aspect for you or? Yeah, I wish the process and the graphic standard was more 
like uniform. But at the same time, there is part of us that always immediately gets bored once there's a standard. You know, so we, again, I was saying like uncurated, curated, we just curated the uncurated. Um, and it's, it was somewhat deliberate because we were interested in each individual designer and the team's representational spirit, et cetera, or aesthetics. But at the same time, that creates enormous um, inefficiency. So I wish I was a bit more, we were a bit more organized in representation too. And hopefully this will bring, or hopefully the current crunch of you know, efficiency after efficiency and no overtime, you know, like people's younger generation or, or the society's direction, which actually happily fo fo focuses us to create a more uh, coordinated, curated style. I hope so. But are you saying that it's better or worse? Or what do you think? It's sometimes confusing, right? It's because the representation is so. That's a good question to ask now. So, well, I mean, what I think is, since you are sort of detached studio from the Rotterdam one, and you clearly wanted to develop your own identity, and, and it's there, and I really appreciate what you said before, that you are maybe building more than what the studio here did by okay. answering, so I may say, people needs more than inspiring in a way. Maybe the graphic could be a vehicle, a medium for this evolution, for this... In the, I don't want to say independence, but you know, yeah, development in a way. And yeah, but as a young architect, which which would you get more excited that you have to use a graphic standard of the office when you enter, or you can do your own graphics? Well, the point is, the, the graphic standard, the graphic is a language, and it must be fitted for what. But that extends to design too. You can do yes. whatever you want. Which one do you like? I would say I will do my own one, like a brand new one, personally. But yeah, you know. so here it is. Yeah, <laughs> but I've, I guess I'm egocentric. So. We're hiring, just by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. A last round of applause. Thank you.